Hey folks, and welcome back to Intro to Philosophy. This is Unit 7 on the Meaning of Life. And today we're going to look at a couple of Greek answers to our question. Namely, uh, things you should have read, Moderate Hedonism by Epicurus, and Stoicism in Caridian by Epictetus. So, here's what we're going to do today. We're going to go over the concept of eudaimonia, that is a concept of a, a life well lived, of happiness and fulfillment, as a general view and as a general answer to our question. And I'll explain what I mean by that. <laughs> we're then going to look at each of the two views, each of the two readings, separately, first Epicureans and how they viewed eudaimonia, what they viewed living well as meaning, and then the Stoic concept of eudaimonia, and then sort of evaluate them together, seeing, you know, does one of them get a better answer? Is this whole uh, living well thing an appropriate answer to our question? And so on and so forth. So technically split a little bit differently in some of our lectures, but hey, we don't always cover two at once. So, just to recap and remind you of the stuff we're talking about, in case you spread these out pretty well. In this unit, we're hitting up the stereotypical philosophical question and the essentially human question, what is the meaning of life? Which, last time we talked about as being possibly the most fundamental and biggest question that a human being can ask. Because the answers to this sort of question can influence and give significance to everything else that we do or rob it of that significance. Take away the purpose and the meaning behind all of our actions. Now, there's not a lot in the way of technical vocab in this unit so far. Like We've not laid out uh, specific terms and ideas that will be used to discuss all of this. We've not talked about uh, specific vocab or concepts or types of arguments that will be used. Instead, we simply uh, ran through the idea of the problem, and we looked at what some of those possible answers might, you know, might or going to be. And this go-around, we're going to talk about two ancient Greek views, views that share a lot in common and yet really couldn't be a whole lot more different from each other. And those two views are Epicureanism and Stoicism. And so by looking at these together, hopefully you can see some of the similarities, view their kind of answer together, and maybe evaluate between the two. Now both of these views come from what's called the Hellenistic period of history. Uh, the time like Alexander the Great and just after, you know, all the way up through the fall of Rome, in which Greek culture has spread throughout the civilized Western world. Uh, so basically this is after Socrates, after Plato, Aristotle, and all them, but before the fall of Rome. So before the fall of the Roman Empire and the start of the medieval period. Um, during this time period, as I said, Greek culture is spreading around, and there's this big push for philosophy and philosophical schools. So pretty much everybody we're talking about either founded or is part of some school or tradition that like takes Socrates' Socrates' ideas and develops them in some sort of direction or another. So, uh, what sort of answer do each of these groups give? Like, like what sort of thing? Are we looking at when we combine these two views? What's the general picture that they give to our question? Because we're talking about the meaning of life. And so when, I, when we study these two together, we're going to assume that there's some sort of a shared answer they have. Well, in order to really answer what it is that makes these two shared together, we have to go back briefly to the Greek philosopher Aristotle, who you've not read, you've not studied in particular, but you've looked at things related to him, because you looked at Socrates and Plato, briefly for the ethics unit, and we'll come back to Plato here in our final unit. Now, Aristotle was Plato's student, just like Plato was Socrates' student. And just like Plato, Aristotle founded a school of philosophy, the Lyceum, in Athens, Greece. In addition to that, he personally tutored and mentored Alexander the Great. Uh, the dude basically is responsible for more of Western culture than any single individual besides maybe Jesus of Nazareth, provided that all the historical evidence is actually correct and do exist. Um, there's a joke that floats around sometimes that Aristotle is essentially responsible for inventing being smart in the Western world. And while that's intended to be a joke and somewhat of an exaggeration, it only is a little bit. Aristotle was a Greek philosopher who literally studied everything. If you study something in the STEM fields, uh, science, technology, engineering, math, and so on, you owe a lot 
to this particular guy. Aristotle literally invented logic, the rigorous way, you know, the rigorous system of trying to think clearly, composing arguments, premises, conclusions, valid arguments, and all that. You have Aristotle to thank for that. If you study science, scientific method, that's Aristotle. Astronomy, largely systematized by Aristotle. There were a lot of brilliant thinkers, especially in the Western world, uh, or actually, I mean to say, especially in the Eastern world, um, China, India, uh, areas of the Middle East, that did a lot of things separately from Aristotle. You know, there's astronomy, and there's math, and there's science, and there are lots of things going on elsewhere. But as we understand them in today's culture, in our society today, the general forms that these things took, Aristotle really kicked this stuff off. He invented rhetoric. He invented logic. Uh, he considered himself primarily a biologist. He's the one who focused on doing experimentation and taking notes and analyzing uh, the empirical world in a systematic and rigorous fashion. So the dude literally wrote on everything from physics to ethics. Uh, he wrote a little bit on religion. And the books we have of Aristotle's are essentially his lecture notes that define and characterize most of the major fields of the university for at least like the last 2,000 years. And he single-handedly characterized science and the understanding of uh, the world around us for more than a 1,000 years. Aristotelian science dominated the world from the time that he came up with it up until Sir Isaac Newton. The reason why I tell you all this is to sort of like emphasize that this dude was a big deal in philosophy and in culture and in history. Now the reason why I bring all this stuff up in this particular lecture, in this particular topic, is that Aristotle's ethical work on the nature of virtue and what the purpose of a human life was particularly inspired the Epicureans and the Stoics. Now we're not going to go into all the details of Aristotle's ethics and the theories that he had about it. You know, he focused a lot on virtue and what the best sort of a life for a human being is, rather than answering things about what should I do in like a trolley car situation or something like that. But in the process of doing all this work on virtue and uh, defining what the best human life is, Aristotle relied a lot on a concept called eudaimonia, which is usually translated as either like flourishing or happiness or something like that. The translations don't work, really work very well in English. We just don't have words to sum up in one idea what's usually referred to by eudaimonia. So throughout the lecture and throughout the rest of the unit, I'm going to refer to it in the Greek. Uh, so eudaimonia is this Greek, ancient Greek concept of flourishing or happiness, sort of like in the sense of like an objective, obje from an objective perspective, you know, like a God's eye perspective, of a life that is well lived. Uh, so it's not just like you don't have a eudaimon life. If at some point you you know, just sit back and go, yeah, my life's going pretty good. You know, like I've got a comfortable job. I've done all this sort of you know, decent stuff. People love me. That's not the idea of happiness that we're going with here. Flourishing is honestly probably the better definition here besides happiness, even though happiness is a little more traditional. Instead, eudaimonia is supposed to cover a concept of a life that's like lived to fruition, like to ripeness. You know, like a grape can be objectively considered to be ripe or not. A human life can be considered objectively to be the eudaimon or not. And so a eudaimon life, a happy life under this concept, is a life that's well lived, that's doing all the things that it's supposed to do, and it's brought about to this successful, uh, ripe, happy, wonderful state. And uh, Aristotle talks about it in terms of purposes. You know, just like uh, a good hammer is a hammer that you know, hammers things very well, a good car is something that does its task very well, you know, like it drives you from place to place very well. A good human being is one that lives well. And so a good human being, a eudaimon human being, is one that has lived well and done all the unique things that a human being is supposed to do very well. It performs its natural function and lives up to its nature in a good and objective way. And again, we're not talking about Aristotle specifically for this lecture, so I'm going to leave off some of the things here. There's a lot more to be said about this guy. I mean, you can be an Aristotle specialist if you ever go into like professional philosophy. So all of that stuff would be a whole other lecture's worth at least.
if not a career's worth of understanding all this and like going into all the details. But the reason why we bring it up is that each of the two folks that we're talking about in the centuries after Aristotle lived and wrote, they really liked this idea and they ran with it. Uh, the Epicureans and the Stoics both saw themselves as working under the same tradition as Socrates. And you've got this nice little line of transmission from Socrates to Plato to Aristotle. And so while Plato and Aristotle went in radically different directions with their ethical views, their views of the world and metaphysics and all this, they still kind of had this shared concept of a life well lived being like the important focus for a human being. And so like philosophy, the love of wisdom, the pursuit of what's most important is supposed to help guide human beings towards this life well lived. And so the first of the two Greek schools we're going to talk about took this and tried to elaborate this concept in a particular way. And it's a way that should resonate with a lot of folks and how they try and approach life. And that's Epicurus. Now, Epicurus is a Greek philosopher coming just a little bit after Aristotle. Um, it's not very long after. I can't remember the dates. So yeah, Aristotle died in 322. Epicurus was born a little bit before the guy died, 20 years before he died. So it's actually conceivable the two could have met uh, had they ever been in the same place at the same time. So not long after the time period, I guess is what I'm stressing. Epicurus took this sort of uh, concept of eudaimonia and developed it in a certain direction. We don't have a lot of Epicurus's work, so we don't have everything that the guy thought or discussed with all this sort of stuff. We do have some serious fragments of his uh, philosophical work. We have work done by his students, by other people that are influenced him, influenced by him, and the people who influenced him himself. So even though we don't have a lot directly from Epicurus, we do know a lot about the guy and a lot about the positions that he held. And generally we know that Epicurus started his own school and uh, came up with a position and a general theory of life and of a life well lived that can be referred to as Epicureanism. Um, and I should clarify that when we talk about Epicureanism, we're talking about it like in this historical context. We actually use the word now and then today in the contemporary world, in contemporary English, to refer to like you know, pure debauchery and pursuing pleasure and like all of the wonderful sensations in life. And that's not quite what Epicurus was about. Rather than the life of debauchery that the current term refers to, historical Epicureanism describes a form of what we might call moderate hedonism. Hedonism meaning, meaning saying that pleasure is what's good and pain is what's bad. Moderate hedonism, though, is going to focus on trying to balance these out in a certain way. So Epicureanism is going to be about pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain, but in specific ways that we'll talk about here in just a second. Now, this life of pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain is what Epicurus ended up thinking constitutes the good life for a human being. It's how a human being can live a happy and well-lived and fulfilled life by pursuing these things and avoiding certain kinds of pain. And the way to do this, he said, was to focus on some pleasures rather than others and to mainly avoid the pains and the disturbance and the distress that can come with just blindly pursuing whatever it is we desire. And uh, Epicurus makes sense of this and sort of outlines what this moderate hedonism would look like through some very simple but powerful arguments. Again, we're not using a whole lot of technical vocab besides maybe the names of a couple of these positions. So if you go through the reading and you look at it like start to finish for Epicurus, he starts off with a discussion of like the idea that no one should fear death. Because this is going to be something that largely motivates us when it comes to what we're trying to do to live a good life. You know, a lot of people get wrapped up in their legacy, they get obsessed about, oh, well, what can I do maybe to uh, avoid death or to have a pleasant afterlife or something? Like these sorts of things are big motivations for people when it comes to trying to figure out how to live a life well. And Epicurus wants to avoid and throw out some of that stuff, because he thinks that idea is just misguided. So he's going to start off his discussion of the good life by clarifying that you shouldn't actually fear death. This shouldn't actually be a big motivating thing for you. Because Epicurus points out, death isn't actually all that bad for you. 
you as a person. And that sounds a little weird, but think about it this way. You never actually directly experience death. You know, and this coming directly from the reading, he says, death, the most terrifying of ills, of bad things, of pains that can happen to you, is nothing to us. Since so long as we exist, death is not with us. That is, so long as we're still alive, death isn't nearby. It doesn't affect us in any way. But when death finally comes into our lives, when it finally affects us, we no longer exist. Uh, if you don't exist, if death is the end of you, if you're not conscious for it, why fear it? You can't. You literally cannot experience it. Um, whenever death finally happens to you, Epicurus argues, you're not around to experience it. You're gone. That's the definition of being dead. So, death shouldn't be this big motivating thing for you. Life shouldn't be about avoiding death or trying to extend your life, um, trying to live well by stretching out your life indefinitely. Now, like you can imagine people like that. Maybe you even know some, or maybe you are somebody like this, where like the concept of death is so big for them. They're so worried about when they're going to die that they end up restricting most of their life to try and stretch it out a little bit further. So like maybe you know somebody, or can at least imagine somebody who's really obsessed with their own health. Like they're really obsessed with, well, I only eat, you know organic small farm carrot sticks that have been cut into a diagonal shape and I only drink pure mineral water from this one remote mountain in the Himalayas because if I do these things I'm going to live an extra three years or something like that. And so you, you can imagine people who sort of like live miserable lives because they want to live as long as possible. This is the exact kind of thing that Epicurus wants to throw out, wants to say this should not be the kind of life that you strive for. This shouldn't be the kind of life that you really focus on. Because it's not about how long you live, to use the common quote nowadays. It's not about the number of years in your life, but the number, but the amount of life in your years. It's more important to live well, however long you live, than it is to try and like stretch out your life indefinitely. And that seems a fairly common sense sort of idea, depending on this, you know, this view of death. Um, so, that's where Epicurus starts with this whole discussion of living well. You, know, you shouldn't let death be the big motivating thing for you. Instead, you should simply try and live as good of a life as you can while you're alive. You know, Take your short, finite time and make it the best possible. So how do we do that? Well, Epicurus focuses on the idea of pursuing pleasure. Because this is something that we naturally do. You know, Human beings, you know, to a certain extent, we're animals just like anything else. We have wants and desires, and we enjoy certain things, and we dislike and suffer in other conditions. So, human beings, when we live well, when we have a pleasant and wonderful life, we do that by pursuing pleasure, by you know, doing things that we enjoy, things that give us pleasure and enjoyment and make life worth living to a certain extent. And this is the exact sort of thing Epicurus recommends. We should live a life that's pleasant, that's wonderful, that's great in all the ways that it can be for us. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you should go and get YOLO tattooed across your chest and do death-defying stunts and get wasted on tequila every night either. You see, Epicurus points out, again with a very common sense but you know useful sort of way that certain desires are not actually all that good for you when you actually fulfill them. You know, like take the desire to, you know, binge drink or something like that. You know, some people really enjoy it at the time. They get, you know, drunk feeling, they enjoy the mild euphoria, they enjoy hanging out with friends, being loose and un uninhibited, and, you know, like living it up in sort of a wild sort of way. The next day, though, really sucks, especially as you start getting older. By the time you hit your mid to late 20s, those of you who are young and still doubt this, by the time you hit like 25, 26, you really start to feel a little bit more. You don't bounce back from things nearly as quickly as you used to. Um, I'm only just now getting into that age bracket, but already it can start to feel things are a little different from when I was 19 or 21 or whatever. So some pleasures like binge drinking or like other things really aren't that good for you, even just on the pleasure pain scale. Because the pleasures that they give last for a night, the hangover lasts for a full, like, 24 hours after. 
depending on you know how crazy you went. So there are some desires, there are some pleasures that carry along a large amount of pain, a large amount of suffering attached to them. And there are other things besides just like, you know, I get eight hours of enjoyment for 24 hours of pain. There are other factors involved as well. There are some kinds of, some kinds of desires, you know, like focusing on your career and doing success and fulfilling your ambitions and all this sort of thing that can cost you important relationships. You can end up living a lonely life, a life that's not really shared with anybody else. You can do it at the expense of all the other wonderful things you could have been doing instead of pursuing your career or this ambition or whatever. So Epicurus argues that there's a lot of desires, there's a lot of drives that are not actually all that good for us. So just pure, unadulterated hedonism, you know, what you might call extreme hedonism, is not a very good idea. Instead, it's far better, Epicurus says, to pursue certain pleasures in moderation. It's more important to avoid pain than it is to pursue pleasure. So the, your main focus for living well, then, should be avoiding pain and disturbance as much as possible. And this isn't, you know, like, to the extreme end of, like, yeah, lock yourself in a room and, um, like, don't do anything, say, like, dangerous or adventurous or anything like that. Because that, too, would be cutting out and adding to yourself a lot of pain. Going extreme on avoiding physical pains or avoiding pains of certain types is also going to lead to a lot of emotional disturbance, a lot of mental disturbance, because you're losing out on all the other wonderful things in life. So, Epicurus says, we should instead focus on this moderate hedonism. By moderating our desires and living prudently, like pursuing the virtue of prudence, of wisdom and caution when it comes to approaching our desires and fulfilling our needs and wants, we can end up living far more pleasant and wonderful lives. And the way in particular that Epicurus focuses on this is that he ends up laying out a distinction between natural desires and unnatural desires, you know, things that you naturally and biologically want, things that culture puts on you or that uh, you've kind of given to yourself. And you can also distinguish between necessary desires and non-necessary desires, things that you, know, you really have to fulfill and things you really don't. And I won't go into a whole lot of detail on that. Uh, that's a little less relevant for understanding the idea of how to live well. Besides, this is an intro-level class, and getting into all of the nitty-gritty mechanics of review is a little bit beyond this. But the important thing to know is that, for Epicurus, it's important to distinguish between different kinds of desires. And to try and pursue this more moderate uh, pursuit of pleasure where you do things like less binge drinking and wild act, wild nights out at the bar, and more like living quietly and enjoying conversation and company of friends, and doing things that you want as so long as they're not going to hurt you or others, even in the long run. So the focus should be on avoiding pain and disturbance, even emotional disturbance, and you know, living a life of moderate, calm pleasure. And this sort of leads to a nice quiet but enjoyable a life well lived in a lot of ways. And so this is the sort of thing that Epicurus argues for. And what Epicurus considers to be eudaimonia, to be a life well lived, you know, fulfillment, happiness. The Stoics, though, take a very different view on this sort of thing. Uh, Stoicism is another Greek school that comes up. And uh, they very much see themselves as continuing the, tr the traditions of Aristotle, especially of Socrates. They very much wanted to get back to the idea of the values and the recommendations of Socrates himself, even more so than the recommendations of Plato. Um, but the Stoics came along a little bit later than the Epicureans did. Stoicism started just a little bit after Epicurus wrote, but it really got going during the Roman Empire. Um, so once the focus shifted from Athens and Greece and a number of other places to Rome, and the Republic grew and then shifted and changed into the Empire upon Julius Caesar taking power, uh, the Romans, especially the Imperial Romans, really adopted Stoicism as like their guiding philosophical view. Like this is the official, quasi-official view of the Roman nobility throughout the Empire. 
And the view was founded by a guy named Zeno of Sidium in 108 BC. So it's a little bit older than the actual Roman Empire. But it gets going, it gets endorsed, and a lot of Roman thinkers um, talk about it and discuss it and try and live up to it in their own lives. And so rather than having a you know reading or a piece of literature that focuses on, uh, like, say, the founder and his views, instead we get little snippets from several of the thinkers that really talked about and developed the view into you know, what we now would understand it as. So our selections in the book come from the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius, yes, the emperor from Gladiator, if you've ever seen it, highly recommended if you haven't, just flat out good movie, uh, the Roman philosopher and senator Seneca, famous for his uh, orations and other things, and from uh, the philosopher Epictetus. And Epictetus has the largest selection in our readings. Uh, you know, the Roman emperor and the standard philosopher Seneca, the two of them are like, pretty straightforward stories, Like although their you know, biographies are still interesting and whatnot. Epictetus, though, I think is especially worth mentioning because this is a guy who started out his career as a slave and ended up um, be becoming freed and essentially devoting his life full time to being a philosopher afterwards. So he went around teaching and basically preaching on street corners, tutoring and develop, uh, developing the minds of students. And he eventually wrote what came to be known as the Enchiridion, which is uh, literally the handbook of Stoicism, like Enchiridion in Greek means handbook or guidebook, instruction manual, something like that. And so Epictetus's work, along with uh, Marcus Aurelius's and Seneca's, really reads like a collection of advice and instructions for living well. You know, again, they really took this idea of eudaimonia, especially as it was important for Socrates and Aristotle, and they took it and really developed it. Now, the summary version of Stoicism actually can be summed up pretty quickly. You know, like where uh, Epicureanism is this view of moderate hedonism, Stoicism's all about that quote you can see there on the left side of the screen. The idea that the purpose of life is happiness, eudaimonia in Greek, which is achieved by virtue, living according to the dictates of reason, eth ethical and philosophical training, self-reflection, careful judgment, and inner calm. You know, it sounds like a very noble philosophy, largely because our ideas of what's noble come from the Romans. And like with the Epicureans, I'm not going to go into a lot of the super specific recommendations that the Stoics gave. Um, instead, I highly recommend you go through the reading for that, because the stuff's not difficult to understand. It's practical life advice. And a lot of it's worth reading and following, even if you're not particularly attracted to Stoicism. But you know, I, I guess I'm just clarifying. We won't go into all of the individual recommendations they make. Rather, we'll talk about their view as a whole, to understand what how they understood living well and what the purpose of life was. So, what's the Stoic good life? What's the well fulfilled? What's the diamond life look like for the Stoics? Well, the Stoics, like the Epicureans, thought that the aim of life was to live well and avoid suffering. So they kind of took some of the same ideas that the Epicureans did. That the focus of life should be to live well, to live happily. And that to a large part, to a large degree, that's going to rely on not suffering and being disturbed by a lot of the things around you and the things that you do. But rather than uh, moderate your desires and pursue only those pleasures that you know, could give you that moderate amount without like overwhelming you with like the hangovers or the social consequences or whatnot, the Stoics don't focus on pleasure at all, actually. When they try and avoid suffering or avoid bad things happening to you, they completely ignore the hedonism type picture. Instead, the Stoics focus very much on doing one's duty and living according to reason and virtue. And the capital R reason there on the PowerPoint slide is actually kind of intentional. They have this really well-developed system of science and metaphysics and religion that all sort of tie together where they view the universe as a whole as being guided by this capital R reason they refer to as the logos, or the word, the reason, the thought that unifies all things. You know, it's the same idea that influences the uh, early Christians when they write in like First John and stuff. But again, we're not going into all the details of the system. But uh, the important thing to focus on out of that whole picture is 
is that the Stoics really advocate following reason. And part of that argument, part of that line of thinking goes like this. Pursuing pleasure, the Stoics said, isn't actually all that good for us. Because it's kind of founded on a misunderstanding. You see, the Stoics say, or argue, that things out in the world aren't actually all that good or bad. You know, there's just stuff. Things happen. And those things aren't necessarily good or bad or pleasant or painful or anything like that. Uh, you know, just a lot of things can go either way. You know, say something normally construed as tragic happens to you, like a, a car runs over your dog, or if you want to really embody the Roman aspect, a chariot runs over your dog. And for a lot of folks, this is going to be a very, very sad thing. You know, it seems like a chariot running over your dog is an intrinsically bad state of affairs. It's a situation that you can legitimately just call bad. But it ain't necessarily so, the Stoics would say. You know, it's entirely possible that you really hated your dog. You know, he was a one mean and insane little creature that terrorized your family, but you couldn't bear to get rid of him for like sentimental reasons. I've got a friend who had a cat like that. He literally referred to it as the cat from hell. Uh, so maybe you've actually got reason to be happy that your dog finally got run over by a chariot. You know, some people would call it sad. You would call it happy. And the same can be true of almost anything that happens in life, the Stoics would say. So things out in the world themselves aren't really necessarily good or bad. Instead, they're all just kind of neutral. Instead, the goodness or badness of something comes entirely from our reactions to it. So calling, say, my dog getting run over good or bad doesn't have anything to do with the dog getting run over. Instead, it's my reaction that really counts in that situation. You know, everything that happens bad in our lives really is only bad because we let it be bad, because we uh, react to it in a way that acknowledges that it's bad. We treat it as bad. Um, so, yeah, if we're going to avoid the bad things that happen in life, we really should start moderating our reactions to things. And the way that this works, or the amount of advice that the Stoics then say about this, has to do with clarifying a couple of more things about the world. So where the Epicureans tried to clarify between kinds of desires, between uh, natural and non-natural desires, between necessary and non-necessary desires, the Stoics want to focus on us better understanding what things in life are up to us and what things are not up to us. And it turns out, according to the Stoics, that almost everything is not actually up to us. For the most part, the Stoics are all universally determinists. They're hard determinists. In fact, many of them believed and argued for an idea of fate, in which not only is the world determined, but some things are going to happen regardless of your participation in them, even. You know, there's no avoiding such and such occurrence happening. The world couldn't have happened any other way. And that's true for almost everything, according to the Stoics, except for one little domain of things, what goes on inside your own head. The Stoics thought that the one exception to everything being not up to us, to being out of our control, was our reactions to things. The one thing we can control in life is how we react to the things that happen to us. So, if the goodness and badness of things lies in our reactions, and our reactions are the one thing that we can actually control in the world, then, oddly enough, you actually have control over what's good and bad in life. And this is especially true when we start consider and like break down what a passion or what an emotion is. You know, when we refer to a passion, when we refer to our emotions, you know, our reactions to things, especially our emotional reactions to things, we can usually call all of those things passions. You know, like happiness, sadness, emotion, these are the passions that influence human life. But the word passion comes from the Latin word passus, which is a form of patty or another etymological joint, you know, wonderful stuff. But uh, the Latin word passus literally means something that happens to you. Uh, like something that you're passive in the activity. You know, passive and passion share the same root. So if a passion is something that happens to you, something that you don't have control over, something that like 
moves over you like a wave. It's something that uh, you didn't bring about yourself. And not letting those sorts of things dominate your life is the exact sort of thing that the Stoics want to argue for. They want to say that, well, you can control your reactions. You can, like, stem, you can fight back against some of these overwhelming emotions of grief and sadness and terror and pain and suffering. You have some amount of control over the things that normally just sweep over you like a wave in the ocean. So, since, uh, you know, being just swept up in these emotions by letting things control you to a certain degree, you experience badness. If you want to live a good life, you shouldn't let your passions and your reactions and other things overwhelm you and rule you. Instead, you should take charge of the one area of your life you can actually control, that is, your reactions to things. And the way to do that, they say, is by living according to reason, by self-reflection, by self-control, and better understanding and, like, picking out which things in life are up to me and which things aren't. So a lot of the practical advice in Marcus Aurelius's Meditations or in Epictetus's Enchiridion, the handbook, is all about reminding yourself and focusing on, yet yeah, this sort of thing is outside my control. Instead, I should simply focus on being as good of a person as I can. I should focus on the things that make me happy in life. Because in addition to being able to control our reactions and our, uh, to a certain degree, our emotions and the things that, uh, how, we, how we react to things, we also have a lot of say over our own character. Uh, because if everything else in the world happens like tragically bad to you, you, know, you lose your job, you lose your family, you, know, you get kicked out on the street, you're in exile from society, the one thing that nobody else can take from you is your character. You know, this is the one thing that the most destitute of men, the Stoics might say, can take refuge in. You can still gain some amount of pleasure and satisfaction from the idea that I am a good person. You know, I can think well of myself if I live virtuously and that sort of thing. In addition, you ought to live virtuously, according to the Stoics, because it's reason that tells us what duty is. You know, we figure out ethics and what we ought to do through reason and philosophical reflection. And since that same reason uh, governs the universe and is the way that we discover our duty, living according to reason is the way to live virtuously. And, and again, there's a whole big system to it that if you're interested in it, I highly recommend checking out some of their pragmatic, down-to-earth advice that comes out of it. But the short version of the story is the Stoics recommend uh, living according to reason, living according to virtue, and keeping control over the one thing in life you actually can control, namely yourself, your reactions, your, your own mind and inner life. And if you can do those things, if you can live according to reason and focus only on those things you can actually control, then you can, in the end, live a life without suffering. If you cannot let certain things in the world overwhelm you, you can control whether or not you live a good or bad life. Thus, in order to live well, you live according to their advice and you be a Stoic. So, that's what the Stoic good life is. And we've already talked about what the Epicurean good life is. <coughs> so, this is the point in the lecture where we usually start asking our evaluation questions. We've got a general idea of what it means to live well for each of these philosophical schools, for each of these uh, like schools of thought, these systems of thought. The Epicureans say that to live well is to live a life of moderate pleasure. The Stoics say is to live a life of reason and virtue. We have to start asking ourselves, are these actual plausible accounts of a life well lived? Are there more things to a good and wonderful life than pursuing moderate pleasure? Or is there more to it than simply controlling our reactions to things and living a life of self-reflection and virtue? Do they leave important things out? Do they miss important aspects of a good life? If you go into the specific advice that both the Epicureans and the Stoics give, you can start to see what sort of things they focus on and what sort of things they don't. Uh, like, for example, the Epicureans say a great deal of many things about the uh, wonderful values of friendship. They considered it, considered it to be a great source of moderate pleasure that often has virtually no downsides to it. Uh, you, you and somebody else both can enjoy each other's company, and there's no hangover, there's no 
degradation of your own self in the process of being a good friend to somebody. The Stoics generally don't talk about it in nearly the same way when they talk about it at all. Instead, they focus much more on self-training and controlling your thoughts and your reactions and uh, having rule over your passions and that sort of thing. So they very much place different emphases on things. Neither of them places a great stock in ambitions and goals and career and accomplishing great things in life. So it's worth asking, do they miss important aspects of a life well lived? Do they, do they leave big areas out of what could make a life well lived and you diamond and wonderful? We also need to ask ourselves, is a life well lived is even a decent candidate for you know, what life's purpose is? Because remember, our question in this unit is, what is the meaning of life? What's the purpose of life? And if I say that the meaning of life is to live well, that's an extremely generic and open-ended answer. You know, it can encompass things as wildly different as the Epicureans and the Stoics, and maybe even wild hedonists and egoists and focus people that focus entirely on themselves. A life well lived can mean a large number of different things. There are also questions to consider about whether or not saying that you know the meaning of life is to live well whether this actually can really answer a lot of questions for us. Because what about individual people? Do we all have the same purpose? Do we all share this generic purpose of simply living well? Or does each individual one of us have a separate meaning or a purpose for our lives? Was I born to do a certain thing? Am I meant to do a certain thing in life? Or am I just supposed to live well just like you know, Johnny down the street or something like that? It's also worth asking uh, whether or not this is a good answer because it doesn't address certain aspects of the question. Usually when we talk about the meaning of life, in addition to saying like, what's the purpose of life, we often want some sort of an answer to what the significance of our lives is. Why was I ever born in the first place? Like, what does my life mean? What's the significance of it? Is my life important in any way? And this sort of answer to uh, the meaning of life, you know, saying that the purpose of life is to live well, that doesn't really address the significance aspect very well. It doesn't focus on the idea that, that uh, your life's important in any way. Because unimportant people can live well just like important people can. You could still be uh, useless and contribute to nothing in the world. And in theory, live well according to one of these theories. You know, the Epicureans especially. They focus on a lot of intuitive and natural things. You know, things that most of us want. But you don't exactly live an important life if you live up to the ideal of an Epicurean sage. So these are all potential issues with the view, things that are worth considering, especially if you go into the in-depth advice that each of these readings contains on how to live well. These are things I invite you to consider. So think about it. It's good food for thought, and I'll see you next time. Happy thinking.